a webinar with Greg Bedell at IBM on the cognitive computing in insurance going beyond predictive analytics. At ITL, we believe very strongly in this sort of topic. Our mission is to gather the best thinking from the best thinkers on insurance and risk management to steer the industry in important new directions. Uh, we believe that the insurance industry is at an historic transitional point, uh, something more significant than has been seen in the industry since Edward Lloyd set up his coffee shop on the wharves of London in 1688. Um, I, I also believe very strongly in this from a, a personal standpoint, not just based on what I've seen in insurance, but based on my career. I spent, among other things, 17 years as a reporter and editor at the Wall Street Journal, largely covering technology. So I've been following technology very closely since I started on the computer beat, and mostly covering IBM, in fact, in 1986. And I've seen the effects of technology ripple outward uh, through the computer industry and then into all sorts of related industries. And it has seemed to me for a while that insurance is one of the last three or four holdouts, and it's finally time. So, uh, as you might imagine, given that sort of focus, we have done a lot on, in particular, predictive analytics, which is such an important force in the industry. And now it's becoming clear that, uh, largely through the efforts of our friends at IBM, the world is moving beyond mere predictive analytics and into what they're calling cognitive computing. The notion being that you can go well beyond these sorts of um, highly organized databases that people have been building for years or even decades and can get at unstructured information, the notes that people take, the interactions on social media, sensors, uh, and so forth. So, uh, and once you do that, then you can do all kinds of things in terms of, of pricing and interaction with customers and so forth that you couldn't do previously. So I'm delighted that uh, Craig is able to, to join us here today. He will, I'm sure, tell you a little bit more about himself as he goes through his presentation. But the basics are that he has spent 31 years in the uh, insurance business with a broad range of responsibilities in underwriting, sales, marketing, and field management. He has also spent 11 years on the software solutions side of the business. Uh, his title is Global Industry Executive of Insurance Solutions. He's also a member of IBM's Industry Academy, a thought leadership group that is gaining importance within IBM. Um, he'll go through his uh, presentation now. Uh, it'll take about 35 minutes or so. At the end of that, we will have a, a Q&A session. Please go to the panel on the right and send me questions as they occur to you as we go through. Uh, we'll get to those at the end. Uh, if there are any logistical questions, you can also send those to me, and we will uh, will respond and help you deal with, with any issues there. Uh, we will follow up later today with links to the presentation, to the slides, and to a, a business value study that IBM's done that's the basis for what a lot of Craig, a lot of what Craig will say, and that uh, is a, a really powerful document. So without uh, further ado, uh, Craig, over to you. Thanks, Paul, and thanks for joining me as I review cognitive computing going beyond predictive analytics and insurance. I began my career as a bond underwriter, uh, became a branch manager, spent 10 years as a broker, and worked in home office. I began my analytic career back when the spreadsheet was invented. Frankly, to me, that was a way for me to begin to harness information and create reports and analyses for myself, both about premium, claims, and productivity that I hadn't had the experience with before. And it, and it was a new enabler for me and, and a great insight for the rest of my team for us to be able to harness that data. You know, that goes back to descriptive analytics. And, and certainly today, business intelligence fulfills a, f a fundamental, foundational, and, and absolutely phenomenal value for insurance uh, executives, analysts, underwriters, um, in being able to provide uh, descriptive information around how the business 
is running. Uh, many insurance companies are well into their journey along business intelligence, but that, that path continues and the level of sophistication and maturity continues to grow. Predictive analytics has been around in, in the insurance industry for quite some time, albeit somewhat sequestered into special groups within the organization. And over the past four or five years, arguably, there's been a democratization of predictive analytics. It's come out of those corners. It's being used more uh, than ever for determining statistically significant correlations to get insight around claims, uh, severity, um, underwriting, uh, um, uh, scoring, uh, productivity by producers, um, all sorts of various insights and, and that too has been, been a journey that insurance companies have been um, on. Uh, the, the third area of analytics, prescriptive analytics, is one that many companies are just beginning. This is applying both descriptive and predictive uh, insights uh, to a rule to help automate a process where the, the uh, insight from the analytics is prescribing different actions and decisions. And this is a, another area of focus uh, for insurance companies and, and part of what IBM has been focusing on in the way of delivering analytics. What we're here to talk today about is cognitive computing. And, and cognitive uh, could be argued to be a form of analytics, but, but I'm going to argue that it's actually a, a, a new era in computing. And in the next few minutes, I hope to describe that to you. But it's, it does involve learning models, experience, um, and feedback mechanisms, which can enhance the analytic processes. And, and I'll talk about that as well. But, but cognitive is, in my opinion, a new competitive advantage for the insurance industry. And I, I hope to illustrate um, and support my argument in the, the next few minutes as we go through the presentation. But, but before I begin, uh, let me explain what, what we mean by cognitive computing. Cognitive technology possesses, processes information more like a human than a computer by understanding natural language, generating hypotheses based on evidence, and learning as it goes. And this is so critical for insurance. Uh, really, in, in, uh, to say it differently, uh, what we're talking about is being able to harness information that was created for by humans for human consumption, i.e. written documents, unstructured data that heretofore has been invisible to computing systems and, and dark as far as the insight that it provides. Think of a, an insurance company, whether it be underwriting manuals, claims procedure guides, claims uh, um, adjuster notes, loss control, um, inspection reports, all of the plethora of information just within our four walls um, that is so rich in insight, whether it be about an individual risk or a class of risk or an entire industry for which we uh, have an opportunity to write better, um, more complete insurance, and, and even new and emerging insurance products and services. It was mentioned earlier that uh, IBM has recently completed through its Institute of Business Value a study understanding customers and risk, your cognitive future in the insurance industry. Uh, you'll all be getting a link um, to a copy of this report, but I wanted to share just a couple of key findings. Um, in our interviews with executives across the globe, uh, we found that they too um, agreed that being able to engage, being able to discover, and being able to decide more about their customers, more about their producers, more about their products and services was, was of critical importance. And when describing cognitive computing to them, uh, those that understood it uh, recognized the, the sheer value that it provides in being able to accomplish these goals. The study also reveals five key forces that are changing the landscape of insurance, and I don't think any of these are profoundly um, outstanding from, from what we know, but to put them on a single slide um, helps to remind us that, you know, the rapid digitization across the landscape, uh, and specifically in insurance, has been a major change 
uh, force for us. Uh, the ability um, and the expectation that we have today to be able to interact with companies with which we're doing business, especially service providers, and then uh, being ready 24 by 7 to respond to our needs has been a, a major impact. The changing demographics, both with regards personal lines but also commercial lines insurance and the globalization of the marketplace in some ways, the, the commoditization that's been driven in personal lines, uh, some of that has to do with the demographics that, have, that are changing in the customer base that's out there. Uh, speaking of the customer base, the rising expectations that customers have of being treated in a, in a way that um, is other than vanilla, um, being able to um, feel appreciated, um, getting services that are specific to their needs. And then on the commercial line side, uh, the expectations, the, the more sophisticated expectations that corporate risk managers have of us as insured, insurers is growing. Certainly low interest rates on the portfolio of assets under management has, has been at play probably for a good eight or nine years, we would argue, and that the effects of that have driven us to a more effective uh, underwriting, underwriting to a profit, um, operational efficiencies, cost-cutting measures, et cetera, and ultimately um, forcing us to run our business as a business and, and not relying on investment income to make ourselves whole as we used to. And then the grow, growth of sophistication in the, the arena of fraud. Um, the fraud has always been an issue. I think we would all agree that that uh, it has become more sophisticated um, as uh, fraudsters determine more than ever the insurance path is one that, that can be profitable for them. Our study found that 98% of those executives that understood cognitive computing felt that it would be pushing the current boundaries of both innovation and growth in the industry. A full 85% of those executives also felt that cognitive would help them focus on improving their engagement with their customer, um, engagement elsewhere, discovery, and decision making. And 95% of uh, the respondents to the study uh, felt that cognitive systems would facilitate uh, better decision making, reduce human bias, and to me, probably the most important aspect, scale their, their human expertise. So what is Watson? Um, Watson is IBM's uh, suite of offerings around cognitive computing. The IBM, IBM Watson is a technology platform that uses natural language processing and machine learning to reveal insights from large amounts of unstructured data. Uh, fundamentally, uh, Watson capabilities uh, do three things. They understand natural language. They generate and evaluate hypotheses, and Watson adapts and it learns. Watson's creating a new partnership between people and computers that enhances, scales, and accelerates human expertise. And I hope to explain that further as we go um, deeper into the, the presentation today. But Watson is taught, it's not programmed. In other words, Watson is schooled. It, it relies on a corpus of information that's fed to it, manuals, frequently asked questions, it basically developing a body of knowledge from the unstructured data that, that I've been referring to already. And then it, it relies on uh, representative questions to establish a ground truth. But from there, it's trained and put to use in being able to answer uh, questions by drawing on that, that corpus of information, quite different than frequently asked questions or wrote um, question and answer capabilities, and I'll, I'll explain that more as we go forward. So how does Watson work? Well, Watson is, is representing and Cognitive is representing an entirely new era of computing. You know, computing began back with the tabulating machine for being able to uh, help us facilitate arithmetic functions more effectively. Then came, along came programmable computing. Uh, conventional um, computing uh, was done via 
um, mathematical principles. It was programmed on rules and um, intended to uh, derive uh, mathematical uh, answers uh, from from the code that was in there. Um, it, it was also um, designed to follow a very linear decision tree type of um, um, approach to providing insights. And this, this approach had worked well for the, the basic kinds of questions that we um, asked of our systems and were expecting to, to be answered. But the, with the substantial growth of big data, the need for more sophisticated evidence-based decision-making, uh, these legacy systems simply couldn't uh, keep up with both the, the generation of the data um, and the ability to, um, to make sense of what heretofore had been uh, dark data, the unstructured data. Um, as professionals, we're all looking to make better insight um, and better decisions um, from the insight that these various and sundry sources of data uh, provide to us. And, and Watson, in many ways, mimics that, that capability. Um, it is able to mirror the as aspects of the human decision-making process, of which there are basically uh, four steps in, that we undertake as, as humans when we're making a decision. The first is that we observe um, visible phenomenon and bodies of evidence. Then with that, we, we uh, attempt to interpret what that information is telling us. We derive, if you will, uh, an hypothesis from that information. And we evaluate those hypotheses as to which are, are the most appropriate for um, the situation at hand. And based on that hy hypothesis, we weigh them and, and pick the one that fits best. And with that, we make a decision and we take an action. This is not at all unlike what Watson does. In fact, these same four aspects of decision making are core to the, the Watson uh, capabilities. So how does Watson work? Um, if we look at traditional computing systems, we were limited to structured data, data that had been uh, put into a database uh, for which specific code had been written to um, measure and apply ar arithmetic equations to that information to draw a conclusion. That doesn't describe us as individuals, doesn't describe well our current business situations, nor the types of decisions we need to make. There's so much more information that's out and about um, to uh, provide more robust insight in the decision-making process, whether that be unstructured data that's in manuals, that's in scripts, that's in blogs, web postings, um, annual reports, um, claims reports, underwriter notes, etc. Being able to harvest this type of information is, is critically valuable in the making a more, more robust decision in insurance. And so what Watson does is it relies on natural language, um, which is governed by rules of grammar, context, and culture, and its um, ability to be able to uh, decipher these words and, and and turn them into meaning is the, the critical differentiator between Watson and, say, for instance, um, text analytics uh, that, that are involved in, say, a search engine capability. We're, what we're doing is using the, the um, attributes of the language, both relative to the, li to the English language in this particular case, as well as the industry, insurance, I would argue, and um, making sense of it, uh, turning that unstructured data into structured data um, using grammatically um, relational and structurally um, analyzed content um, pertinent to the, the decision-making process. So how does Watson learn? I told you earlier that, that it is a learning system. Let's, let's talk about an example within the medical practice, cancer, of which there are multiple 
different types of cancer, just as in insurance there are multiple different types of risks or coverages, if you will, or claim types. And each of those <coughs> particular types of cancer or claim types have different um, symptoms in, in the medical case, treatments and side effects in um, insurance. There are different procedures, different outcomes, different uh, rules and different regulations that apply, all of which need to be taken into consideration um, for, uh, uh, for our analysis. Additionally, that insight in medicine comes from uh, both the um, historical journals that we have, newly published studies, white papers, all sorts of publications that are out there. The same is true in insurance, both our historical documentation, new documentation and insight that comes in relative to a particular account, particular claim, but also trending information that comes both from the financial community as well as other, say, annual reports and in, in the commercial line space, um, insights from social media about um, the, the demographics of our personal line space, uh, and new risks, new and emerging risks that come from legislature and, um, and experience that, that we read about um, in, the, in the trades. All of that information is, is fodder, if you will, for the base uh, pool of, of information from which Watson will begin to draw its insight. That information is gathered and collected and, and becomes what we refer to as the corpus corpus upon which Watson draws its insights. And, and by being able to um, analyze that information and begin to score it, the process of um, informing Watson begins. But it takes a, an analyst, it takes an expert <laughs> to also go through that information and determine what's not reliable, what might be out of date, what isn't respected in sight, and to to parse that from the corpus. Uh, this is referred to as curating the content. Once the content has been curated, Watson can go to work at being able to ingest that information by developing metadata, by developing indices. It's able to organize the information to expedite um, its application to uh, the question and answer process, to the insight process, and, and develop scores, which we'll talk about in a second. The next step is, is beginning to train Watson. An expert, again, will take his or her expertise relative to a subject and begin to apply that uh, to the process. This is referred to as machine learning. That expert will create a base set of questions and answers that um, serve as a ground truth for for Watson. This isn't a, a canned Q&A akin to a frequently asked question um, type of approach, but rather to give context for Watson for the terminology, for the jargon, for the various phrases and their meaning relative to, in, in our case, insurance, so that it, it can fine tune its understanding and interpretation of the corpus. Then Watson goes to work and from that basis is able to then begin to generate um, new answers to new questions and, and begin its interaction with users. As it begins in, to uh, engage with, with users, it grows its um, ability to answer more questions and, and in more robust ways. It's also ingesting new data um, as it's updated, um, as it's published, as it becomes available to be ingested into the system. And along the way, <laughs> an, an expert will periodically review um, Watson's learning to fine tune it and feed those fine tunings back into the system. So we're talking about a continuous improvement process to make Watson smarter and more robust in its ability to address um, expected but more importantly unexpected questions and the, the longer the system is is operating uh, the deeper Watson's knowledge base uh, uh, becomes. So how does Watson build and enhance 
expertise, which to me is, is the most interesting aspect of this. The same approach that, that I've been describing, being able to understand what the written word has, um, was intended to interpret, um, is what Watson goes about doing first. And, and to do this, it develops various hypotheses as to what that meaning is, and then it, it scores and ranks those hypotheses based on its confidence level. From those confidence levels, it can then begin to draw a, an answer to a particular question. Additionally, it can connect answers to various, from various questions and sources to provide additional insight that we may not have had before. And, and I'll touch on that, on this in a little bit greater detail in a minute. But first and foremost, what it does is it allows us to extend the collective expertise of the organization and, and best practices across for instance, all of our underwriters in the organization, all of our claims adjusters, and be able to f free them up to apply best practices in a way that they haven't had the ability to do before. We're, we're able to, like I say, leverage that, that expertise. Additionally, for our individual experts, we're able to uncover, as I pointed out earlier, connections between existing and new materials um, that support an answer to questions we may not have um, asked ourselves before or even thought to ask of the data because we didn't realize the insights that, it, that were there. Watson helps therefore extend the analytic capabilities of even our best analysts by pointing out thing, areas of interest and insight to them. And, and ultimately the organization as a whole benefits by being able to provide our knowledge workers with the insights and expertise to apply to the daily decision making relevant to insurance. So what makes Watson different? Well, Watson understands language, it understands what is being asked, and it's able to find and communicate answers. And, and how, does, how can Watson be used? Well, it can be used to engage in conversations, explore and find information, discover information and relationships, and deciding, making decisions by evaluating information against defined criteria. And in the end, being able to explore, interpret, and analyze provides tremendous value to us as, as insurance professionals in the daily course of our, our business. So what are some of the characteristics that represent good uses of Watson? Well, first and foremost, high volumes of unstructured data, and I don't think there's anyone participating in the call today that would argue that, that we're lacking uh, unstructured data in insurance. Um, English language, uh, presently Watson supports uh, the English language. We're rolling Spanish and Japanese out very soon, and other languages will follow uh, immediately thereafter. <laughs> Um, where a business requires answers with evidence, and certainly we do in, in all aspects of insurance, we need to make reasonable and defensible decisions, whether they be underwriting, rating, or claims. And users want to explore multiple answers. And again, um, the beauty of being able to extend um, our competitive reach is by differentiating in a way um, others might not um, in, the, in the business of insurance, and so that's critical being able to support dialogue when appropriate, and, and that too is a, um, an important attribute, and we'll talk about customer self-service in a second. And then to be able to continuously learn, and, and we know especially now just how dramatically uh, the insurance industry is changing and the risks around us are um, expanding and, and maturing, so critical, important at, uh, as far as an attribute in insurance. So let's peel the onion back a little bit and talk more about cognitive and insurance. Um, in addition to Watson being a platform of services, uh, IBM through its Watson division is also building out different industry specific solutions. One of the first is Watson Underwriting Advisor which enables underwriters to operate more effectively. and. Uh, 
basically what we're, we're able to do is read and understand natural language contained within unstructured documents, continuously learn based on feedback, and create comprehensive evaluation process um, to cl uh, collect, integrate, and visualize and evaluate risk. At the end of the day, what this is this um, application of cognitive computing is able to do is is help the underwriter assess a risk, <laughs> apply best practice underwriting rules, and help him or her make more effective decisions relative to the risk. The benefits of Watson Underwriting Advisor include evaluating the submission rather than gathering data. So uh, an underwriter is free to apply his or her intellect to the, the risk as opposed to spending their time collecting the data and uh, not ha being able to imaginate um, and apply their, their unique insight um, to the particular risk. It reduces time to process each submission. There, there's obviously a direct impact on the reduction of the underwriting expense the incorporation of best practice expertise uh, for consistency and accuracy, and we're able to scale our underwriting staff by, by making the underwriting process more compact. Um, we're, we're obviously able to um, increase the workload and the throughput. A quick view of um, transforming the underwriting process with, with the um, Watson um, underwriting solution both in the review of the application completeness, the review and um, applying review and apl application of underwriting guidance, <laughs> and then the recommendations to the underwriter for his or her decision making. There are Watson attributes that play into this, and um, the cognitive underwriting is supported by, as you can see, uh, example customer data as well as as Watson data drawn from public sources and others. An example that comes first from our banking and, and specifically our investment banking brethren within IBM is Watson Wealth Advisor. So currently today there are a number of investment bankers that are using Watson to help their wealth managers uh, first understand the risk appetite of their client um, and then the risks of different um, issues and being able to um, coach and consult with their client to, to uh, really put together a portfolio and a program that best meets their particular investment guidelines, appetite, and risk um, uh, demographics. Um, imagine, if you will, that uh, a, um, an annuity underwriter an annuity um, specialist is able to take this same approach in, in um, his or her relationship with their clients. Um, another example would be the controller or the Office of Finance being able to do a similar analysis around the portfolio risk for their assets under management. But this is catching the attention, as, as I said earlier, especially in life and annuity. A clear low-hanging fruit opportunity is, is the virtual CSR or the self-service call center capability. <laughs> Being able to extend expert personalized advice, strengthening relationships through better customer advice and information sharing, increasing revenue through better informed next best action, cross sell and upsell, and improved operational efficiency. Companies like USAA who experimented early with this capability, um, albeit not specific to their uh, policy, but rather to their customers' lifestyles. Um, so for, for military people who were leaving s the service and returning to civilian life, uh, the ability to interact with Watson to get advice and question, answers to questions about um, their transition from military service to civilian life, services that were available to them from uh, various sources, um, whether they be government or private sector, um, advice about um, uh, where to live, etc. Uh, these, were, these were the types of questions that, that um, Watson was set about 
to help um, them answer. But think about being able to extend um, advice to a, a customer um, and insured when when they have a life chain life event occurring. Uh, they may be leaving an apartment and uh, buying a house and, and have some questions. Uh, this gets to a, a, a fundamental point that we found across industry. Uh, people are are willing to ask um, a, a an intelligent system like Watson questions that they might be uncomfortable asking of a um, of another human being, and and having that insight allows them to get a, a foothold um, on the the types of questions that they would want to and then ask um, of the human that they're dealing with as far as um, uh, next uh, purchases or, or service questions that they have. Speaking of which, there are multiple dimensions of, of who could be served by, by this sort of system. I've been talking about insureds, but producers, especially new producers um, who, who need advice um, around uh, products and services. Uh, think of the old appetite guide and being able to um, have someone as far as a producer be able to ask a, uh, a question and get a real detailed summary not only as to the company's appetite regarding that risk but the the best uh, suite of um, coverages um, for for that account. Uh, so too um, is the field staff set for benefiting from being able to interact with a Watson um, capability like this. So some other areas of insurance that, that benefit from cognitive include claims adjusting. So being able to look at um, and, and harvest insight from other similar claims and, and being able to ask uh, for uh, best approaches to the um, adjudication process on a particular complex claim uh, would be one area. Um, marketing optimization and customer insight. Certainly, uh, we've been hard at work at, at trying to differentiate customers and customer groups and, and design uh, marketing campaigns towards them. But think of being able to harvest all of the unstructured data that's outside of the four walls of our organization, whether it be about an individual customer but even more importantly about a group of customers or a class of customers, whether they be personal or commercial, and drawing new insights about uh, their interests, their, um, their journey through life, their journey through business, their exposures, and, and both for service perspectives as well as new coverage perspectives, gaining and harvesting insight. Legal risk and exposure. Uh, wouldn't it be wonderful to understand how the courts have been interpreting the various claims uh, that have gone through the legal process in, in various and sundry courts and jurisdictions and being able to come up with a, an actual um, risk analysis for those. And, and that is, in fact, possible today with the, with the likes of, of Watson. Equally important, uh, wouldn't it be interesting to really know how courts have interpreted the policy language within our policy? You know, we, we scribe uh, the language with a, a coverage in, in mind. Um, it's not until the claims process and typically the legal process that we actually understand what those words meant from a legal liability perspective and being able to harness that insight. Again, court records being public and, and currently unstructured, being able to get that insight would be of tremendous value, uh, both from the underwriting and the pricing side, but obviously from the legal um, side of the equation as well. Before I finish, I want to tell you that, that Watson certainly is a platform of capabilities and there are many services to draw upon. We at IBM are drawing upon those services as well to mix those back into our portfolio. We talked about the value of business intelligence a little bit earlier. We have woven cognitive computing into the into our business intelligence uh, package. Uh, IBM Watson Analytics for Insurance uh, embraces these same sorts of capabilities to be able to call through both the structured and the unstructured data 
um, to suggest back to the user questions that they could be asking of their data that, that they may not have thought of. In other words, how can I better understand my policyholders to improve retention? That may be a question I want to ask of that data, but Watson knows from being able to analyze the information that it has at its avail through the BI system that it can answer that particular question, so it poses it to the user. If you're interested in learning more about that, there's a link here in the on this particular slide, but it's a phenomenal addition to the, the basic business intelligence capabilities of the IBM suite. Um, just one service that I thought I'd highlight for a second. Again, you can go out and experiment with this on your own. As you can see, there's a try it out uh, button that I've um, screen grabbed from the website. But Personality Insights is one of the Watson services where if you um, copy and paste, uh, I think it's 3,500 words to be statistically significant, um, into the tool uh, that you have written, whether it be from a blog or post or Facebook, um, it will go through and analyze and come back and give you an, an analysis of your, your personality profile, uh, your likes, your needs, your characteristics, etc. Um, it's an interesting tool to um, uh, to experiment with for a company, it's profoundly valuable, as I mentioned earlier, in the investment space to be able to understand someone's risk appetite uh, from information that we're able to get through through the discussion around um, investment appetite and, and elsewhere um, to look at desirability features, not necessarily about a single individual, but groups of individuals to gather insight around trends and uh, within certain demographics uh, can be hugely valuable in insurance. Uh, we have other services like Tone, which, which is there to interpret the demeanor and, and uh, temperament of a caller, et cetera, based on their language. But I'd encourage you to investigate these services, all of which make up part of the Watson family. We started off by talking about the white paper, the study that the Institute of Business Value at IBM created, and the insurance version is available. Uh, you'll be getting some information afterwards uh, to uh, get yourself a copy of this particular study. I, th I think you'll find it of value. With that, I'll, I'll close and, and turn this back over for questions and answers. Uh, I hope it's been helpful. Uh, there's a lot more I could tell you, a lot more IBM would like to tell you about the value of Watson and Cognitive in the insurance space. Thank you very much. Uh, Paul? Yeah, great. That, that's great. Thanks very much for that. There are, in fact, a number of questions that have, have queued up. Um, why don't we start with this one, which is uh, what is the, the readiness like of the underwriter advisor offering? It is ready to rock and roll. It's um, it's something that we have customers deploying. It. There's a public um, uh, announcement by Swiss Re uh, where they're beginning with with life insurance. Again, um, each company is going to want to train it in its own way, but it's it's um, deployable today. Okay, another question: How long does it take to get up and running and start yielding results? There's no fixed answer to that, but it's ability to begin to have confidence in the types of insights that Watson provides is going to take a, a company a period of time to, in other words, the teaching aspect of it is going to take a period of time. The bigger issue is going to be making available to the system the various and sundry data sources developing out that corpus. So its answer is it depends. And, and what I mean practically by that is in some cases a, a lot of my data, so, so in an underwriting case, a lot of my data is going to be spread across um, manuals and things of that nature. Those are going to have to be collected and converted into, into a digital text form if they aren't already and then they're going to have to be ingested by Watson. Then the work of teaching it the context of the for interpretation by the company will be the next phase. Okay. So this sort of builds on an earlier question, but uh, someone says, uh, I'm confused, uh, I'm not sure I understand. Is Watson a single product 
uh, are the product uh, or products presented available? You already talked about the underwriter advisor, but can you talk more broadly? Yeah, so, so Watson, Watson first and foremost is an entire is an entire family, a category, if you will, from cognitive computing. It is made up of a, a number of different capabilities within that capacity of cognitive. They are all aligned within the IBM's approach has been to align all of those as complementary services to what we're calling the, the Watson platform. So there are various and sundry services associated with that. Think of it, I, I personally have thought of it as senses. In other words, seeing, hearing, and then subservices within that. And that, that's how that's being expanded out. Okay. Um, several attendees are asking about the ROI of cognitive. How are your clients building a business case around cognitive? There are, there are a number of, of approaches to it, but, but very simply at the highest level, I think the, there are... Uh, several general categories. There's the value that comes from being consistent and accurate. There's the there's the value that comes from me being able to apply, allow my knowledge workers to apply their knowledge on a day-to-day -day basis as opposed to the, the time spent in assembling information to then apply their knowledge. So there's the whole scaling side of things. There's a there's a risk avoidance attribute of, of all of this for not doing it in a, in a more consistent or precise manner. There's market opportunity, being able to associate new ways of, of approaching risk with greater insight. And then I think probably the, the, the simplest uh, and most straightforward one is, is in the aspect of the, of the call center and, and providing uh, self-service and again extending the capacity of the call center. So it's um, efficiency, accuracy, scalability, and discovery are, are the, the major uh, buckets that I've seen. Okay. Are you suggesting that at some point cognitive will replace predictive analytics? Okay. Predictive analytics, it, it, it can certainly be used in the process of, of cognitive. So to differentiate the two, and I say this passionately, predictive is, is, um, is looking for statistical significance in structured data that I have. So what is, what is the, the correlation? The, what is the coefficient? What, what, what is my structured data telling me? And it's very you know, mathematically inclined. The cognitive at the end of the day is really turning what heretofore has been uncaptured dark data, the unstructured data, into structured. Once structured, uh, there will be some aspects of that data that I will now want to apply predictive analytics to. So I see them as being complementary. I see cognitive driving further utilization of statistical analysis. Okay. So someone is, that, is, is saying, I'll, I'll just read the, the question. Adjuster notes in bulk are written hastily by many different people with ambiguous context and very different writing styles, often using confusing and inconsistent grammar, spelling, punctuation, abbreviations, and acronyms some of which are so used so infrequently that there are no precedents from which to learn. How can companies best organize internally to engage with cognitive technologies? What resources need to be dedicated to be successful? So that was either one of my colleagues who pre-scripted that, <laughs> or, 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 it, or it was a very astute listener, and I thank either of them. So the, the short answer to that is, if, if anybody saw Watson compete in Jeopardy, you quickly realized that it was able to tackle the various linguistic tricks that are that make the Jeopardy television show exciting, um, at least to us Americans who, who watch it. But the, what, the, what I'm saying to someone who may not be familiar with uh, the television show Jeopardy, it, it exercises um, as much knowledge as it does one's ability to understand the English language. So the science behind making that possible begins to address one half of the, one third of the question that was just asked. The other the other part of it and 
well, two parts. The, the subtlety of, of the English language and then it, it being written differently by different people. And then the aspect of the, the peculiarities of, a, of an industry or an individual <coughs> are aspects of, of how we teach it. And it will learn over time, which is the beautiful part of it. Now, there will be time, then I'm going to begin to answer, I bet, another question that's out there. And that is, what do you do when Watson can't answer a question? And we were just meeting with a client yesterday who you know, is setting up a protocol for when someone calls in and the question can't be asked. They, they've set up a methodology for how it gets warm transferred to, to someone who can hopefully help them. Um, in that regard. So the, the system does need to be trained and I'm recalling in that question, you know, sometimes people will say something in a very unusual way that nobody else says. That may, may require some intervention. Okay. Um, so another one. My organization is currently implementing analytics. Can the cognitive components work over a diverse platform, uh, i.e., through APIs? Uh, is it too late? Oh, it's not too late. It would it would be, in fact, a separate platform, and 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 Watson is also, you know, cloud-based. Additionally, so it it wouldn't necessarily require that platform, and in fact, the platforms would be by nature quite different because the business analytic platform is one that's going to look to databases and look to other and sundry sources of data from which to um, to read its insight. Okay. Um, someone asked, how do we reach out to IBM to explore ideas? A couple of ways. The, the, the first, and I think you're going to announce to the audience that there'll be a follow-up email. Secondly, I'm happy to help direct traffic. There, if you go to... Um, IBM.com slash Watson. There's a there's um, a means to interact that way if you're interested in insurance. IBM.com slash insurance, and there are ways to to contact us in in both those regards. Okay, I'm trying to scroll back through the questions, and uh, I just found it. Um, so what job opportunities will close because of uh, cognitive computing and which ones will open? Yeah, you know, so cognitive, and, and we're very careful to, to, to say this, you know, the, there's a creepiness factor that can come into all of this if, if one wants to look at it as if cognitive somehow is going to replace human beings. That's, that's not the case. We're talking about enriching expertise. Now, when I talk about being able to scale call center capabilities or I'm able to scale certain types of decisions, might might we deploy those, you know, deploy the time differently for people? Um, absolutely. But I do truly believe that in the face of all the change that's especially in insurance that's occurring in insurance today, you know, we're going to have to become much more sophisticated in the way we service our customer and the kinds of products and services we develop. And I think this is going to open a door <coughs> for, for those companies that are really interested in, in developing. You know, we throw the word competitive advantage around um, pretty liberally in, in this line of work. I'm, I'm going to not say it that way. I'm going to say talking about changing up the business models in, in ways that, that haven't been done before. And, and I think that's the direction many companies are going to explore. What makes sense and what doesn't and where can I draw insight from all of this that I haven't before. And, and that's going to take a whole new chapter. Look, look back six or seven years ago at how many insurance companies had chief data officers and chief uh, analytics officers and analytics staffs. Uh, there were very few, and that's that's now more common uh, than it is uh, unique. I think we'll be at the same place in a couple of years when it comes to, to cognitive computing as well. Okay. Is there a particular size company that is most suited for? I mean, do you have to be gigantic to do this or, or not? Again, it's available through 
through um, web services in that regard. You know, frankly, some of the quick, more nimble companies tend to be those that aren't the largest companies. It, it, all of this change boils down to executive sponsorship and passionate business leadership. If, if there's a, a person listening who's got the gumption to either do it himself or herself or convince their boss that there's something to explore, um, it'll be that, that instance where, where the change begins to, to happen. We're talking about change. Change is uncomfortable, whether it's um, switching shoes or it's, it's talking about cognitive computing. And, and obviously, there's a scale of difference there. But the, the point is, it takes some gumption. It takes a commitment. Um, and it takes sponsorship. Okay. Yeah. In, in in my experience, change is easy as long as you have to change and I don't. Right. <laughs> um, so actually, I just lost it. Um, but the uh, question was about what sort of uh, uh, resources are needed to uh, to implement Watson. You you touched on that a little bit earlier, but uh, I'm wondering if you could. Um, go into a little more detail on, uh, in particular, underwriting, I see the question that covers what, what kind of investment is, needs, is needed in terms of input and just generally setting it up. Yes. <laughs> there are, I, I have colleagues who have first-hand experience that, that would um, be able to provide um, much level, much greater levels of detail around this, the, the types, and we have services that we're happy to provide um, our clients and, and in partnership. And we have many partners as well who are, are um, a part of this new Watson ecosystem. To answer the question, it, again, it's going to depend on the, the scale of the project. That the, It's definitely going to involve business experts uh, first and foremost, it's going to in involve their technical brethren for making the services available. And um, and to some degree, for sure, it's going to, to involve, you know, IBM, Watson, Plus. That That's, that question hasn't an easy answer because of, of the scale, uh, the, the varied scale that any of these projects could could. Okay. Um, so maybe one or two more, because we're getting to the end of, of the hour, and I want to respect everybody's time. Um, uh, are there particular examples of what one attendee uh, called economic lift that you can provide uh, based on uh, work with uh, with Watson, or is it still kind of early days to be specific about that? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned a little bit earlier when I answered the ROI question, which I'd, I'd say is a, another way of phrasing economic lift. It, it's, you know, it's around the, the capacity, economic lift itself would be around the capacity side of, of things as I interpret it. To be able to state any specific numbers, it is pretty early in the process. We're working hard on building out case studies as um, we have more of them and they're they're further into their maturity so we can obviously wave the flag around that sort of statistic. I haven't any off the top of my head, but I, I have colleagues in the Watson insurance team who I'm sure can provide you know some more uh, information if if somebody's Okay. Um Okay, well, this is terrific. Um, I've certainly always been fascinated by Watson um, and think that uh, there probably are others in the audience who are uh, intrigued by Jeopardy. I've tried out twice and think I've done well, and somehow they haven't seen fit to invite me on either time. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, uh, Craig, thanks very much for doing this. Thanks, everybody, for attending. As I said, we will later today be sending out links to the uh, the, the full presentation, um, also to the slides, and then to the um, at the business value study that Craig has mentioned. So just uh, thanks, everybody, and have a great day.